31. Welcome to Rotted Reviews, and today I'm going to be covering the 31st film to carry the Amityville name, the 2021 release of an Amityville poltergeist. And so before we get into whether or not this movie is any good, let's discuss what it has to do with Amityville. Nothing. Nothing at all. All. This is another situation in which it had an original name. In this case, it was either No Sleep or Don't Sleep. And during the distribution process, it changed the name to something that was able to capitalize on a franchise without actually infringing on any legal rights. So if you're looking for any kind of connection to the house in Long Island, to the DeFeo case, or to George Lutz, look elsewhere. There are none to be found here at all. So let's step back away from the name now and take a look at what this movie actually is. Written and directed by Calvin McCarthy, we get introduced to the character Jim. And Jim is a guy that... I don't know. <laughs> He's honestly one of the most tapioca-flavored generic characters I've ever seen put to screen. Regardless, he's a young man that wants some money and been searching for a job online with his friends in the room he finds an ad for a couple that are looking for somebody to watch the house over the weekend and are willing to pay $100 a day to do it. And so he jumps at the opportunity and he gets to meet this family as they go over the rules and so on. Ah, uh, I am doing what I can to ease your mind here. You are not making it easy. My own son yelling at his mother. You're good to your mother, aren't you? And generally, that's the way things go. They leave him alone. He watches over the house. He can't sleep. Every time he tries to sleep, he gets awakened by some sort of disturbing vision of somebody creepily walking up the stairs, one thing or another. And as the movie progresses, he gets more and more dour and irritable as this lack of sleep really starts affecting him. And interspersed within this plot line are a series of flashback sequences just to set a couple months prior where we get introduced to the grandmother character of this family as she's basically going through the same things. She's not able to sleep. She keeps seeing things like the creepy person walking up the stairs, things like that. And it just kind of seems to want to coalesce into a bridging of these plot lines. The problem is it never really gelled toward that end, and whatever kind of plot mishmash that it was trying to come together for a big reveal, the problem, more than anything else, was the fact that I personally checked out about five or ten minutes into this movie. So clearly I didn't care for this one, but I gotta be honest, Cards on the table, this was far from the worst entry in the Amityville series, but that's not really saying a whole lot for this particular movie as much as it is for the absolute dreck that had come preceding it. Really, this was not obnoxiously bad. This was not just bad taste on bad taste on bad taste. More than anything, what this was was amateurish. This had a lot of rough edges to it and I could see a lot of potential in there if it had been worked more, if it had been fleshed out more, if those rough edges had been sanded down more, and if it had the benefit of a lot of years of practice in terms of writing and directing and camera work and sound design and acting and so overall, it just kind of wound up in this place of an inexperienced pudding that I could kind of get the gist of what it was trying to come across as. It just, it didn't have the vocabulary to get there. As far as the camera work or the cinematography goes, this shows a lot of weird angles and strange color palettes and even stranger framing choices. All told, the visual aspects of this didn't really, it just didn't seem to want to capture me at all, either with interest in the characters of the plot or in any kind of scary fashion. And speaking of the scares, there were a few of them present in here, but all of them fell completely flat. And that mostly comes down to the editing. When you're trying to establish a jump scare, it really comes down to the editing, the timing of when you're going to be cutting from one angle into an impossible shot and what kind of sound effect and so forth you're going to be overlaying on top of that. 
that makes a jump scare work, as well as the lead time coming up to it. Jump scares, I am an advocate for them. I like them. But 95% of the time, they are mishandled terribly. And that's why I think they get the bad reputation that they do. And this film is a prime example of exactly that. And even pulling back further, let's go back to basics. Just the writing, the characters, the dialogue. None of it felt real. This was primarily a character-driven story. This was somebody that we were supposed to be following and caring about. This was our protagonist. But it failed on that level because there was nothing really interesting about Jim. It gave him some backstory that he was relaying to other characters that had kind of a sad history to it, but none of it really explained who he was, what he was about, what conflicts he was trying to overcome, how he was going to overcome them, what about himself would he try to conquer in an effort to reach this end goal of overcoming this conflict. None of that ever was present. There was no arcs, there was no suspense, there was nothing to really latch onto. It was just following this guy around as he just looked sleepy. Tell me, as an audience, how are we supposed to stay awake with that? And as far as the dialogue goes, it was very clear that that was simply a device to disseminate information to the audience. We are not trying to have characters relate to one another. We're not trying to have them have a connection with one another. We're not even trying to establish a friendly banter so that we can latch on to the bond that they share. Instead, we are simply learning about who this person is in the context of the story because the dialogue is directing us in that fashion. And that's a lazy way to go. That's a a perfect example of tell don't show which is the opposite of what you should be doing this should be show don't tell just think about how many times you're sitting down with friends is there a whole lot of exposition do you establish who that person is what they're about why they're sitting there every single conversation that you have with them of course not but things do get explained in the natural course of subtle hints through plot elements, through conflict, that kind of thing. But to simply have two characters talking with one another as they firmly establish whomever might be listening in the room exactly the information that that third person might need to catch up, that's just lazy writing. So what about this movie did work for me? Let's stop with the negatives and start trying to find the nuggets within that can make this really kind of shine and pop. Well, for one thing, the effects. Kind of, sort of, I <laughs> don't want to go necessarily negative on this, but I could see where they were going. Again, this is simply a, a, a situation where they needed more refinement, where they needed more practice. However, in the entire spectrum of all these talents and professions within the entirety of a filming process, I would say that the visual effects were among the more adept. Yes, some of them were more cheesy After Effects things that were really kind of a little bit groan worthy, but I don't really necessarily fault the visual elements of that. Again, they could have used a little bit more refinement, but moreover, I think with some proper editing, it would have been a lot easier to sell the visuals. If we weren't getting prolonged shots and instead just a little snippet to give us a little good jump scare with some proper editing and some good timing and a nice little follow through with some sound effects, I would say that that would have worked remarkably better and it would have been a lot easier to overlook the sins of the visual effects as they were. You can have the best practical effects ever on the screen. The Thing is a good example of this. However, the longer you stay on a shot and the worse the lighting is and the worse the editing is, nothing is ever going to look real. It's supposed to be a harmonious symphony that sells these scares and I gotta say that lacking the other elements of this, the visual effects, I was able to recognize as something that was adept, but it was a little bit harder to hide the blemishes. And so I want to make abundantly clear as I wrap this video up, especially if Calvin McCarthy is watching this, please don't stop. Please continue filming. Please continue making movies. Please continue writing. Continue and practice and learn from mistakes. This is a negative review. I'm not going to make any bones about that, but it's not meant to be a personal insult. This is meant to be a learning opportunity. So please take this as the honest from the heart criticism of the art piece that it is meant to be and use it as a method to keep going because that will be the best possible outcome 
for having this movie be made is to have a practice run, some good honest criticism, some learning from that, and some improving in the future. Please continue. I look forward to seeing what you put out next time. I truly do. And thank you for watching this to everybody else out there. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click like and subscribe. It does help me a whole lot. And beyond that, I'm going to wish you a fond farewell and I'll see you on the next video. Remember next time you want to watch a horror movie first, make sure that it's good and rotted.